Victor family, how are we doing? It is day three of our fast and it's time to eat some of that fresh bread. So let's get into it. I'd like to open with a poem too. So, Lord, I ask for a fresh revelation of your blood, a sinful people where the only proper correction was a flood. Blind eyes open, revealing your works in a man through your spit in the mud. God, you sent your son into this world to die, displaying your love. Holy Spirit, fall afresh on me violently like a dove. Your presence is that which my heart desires. Tenderly blow on the flame of my heart growing into a wildfire. Death, burial, and resurrection. I am a new creation for in the mirror all I see is your reflection. Dead to sin and alive in Christ. Let this fast be a marking consecration of my life. My King, it is an honor to be your wife. So hopefully that poem blesses you guys. So we'll go ahead and we'll just jump right into our devotional. And this is pretty much going to be setting up just a vis visualization of us being separated from God. And then we're going to kind of look at the cross and Jesus' death. So let's get into it. Dear Beloved, I find myself only a short while after Resurrection Sunday still meditating on the blood Jesus spilt on the cross. His blood. The King of Kings willingly laying down his life to be slain. The bread of his body being broken and the wine of his blood being spilt out into the earth. And victoriously, his resurrection. Everyone praise the Lord. As I have been meditating on Jesus and his crucifixion, Holy Spirit has brought me back to the beginning of the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 3, 8, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And Adam and Eve were in the presence of God and walking in communion with him. This was in accordance with God and his original intent for creation, for man to abide in God and God in man. But due to the disobedience of Adam and Eve, they broke the commandment of the Lord. And the repercussion of breaking this commandment was death. And you can read that in Genesis 2, 17. Now, not only were Adam and Eve going to die, but God decreed a curse. And God also speaks this in Genesis 3, 17 through 20. And now God also spoke that to them before. What would happen if they eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that if they ate from that fruit in disobedience, that they would die. And that kind of plays into the curse that the Lord spoke there. So just a quick recap. God bursts creation, and it is good. And we see that in Genesis 1, 31. God gives man dominion over the earth to subdue it, and he blesses them to do so in Genesis 1, 28 through 29. And then Adam and Eve break God's commandment, and then God issues a curse in response to Adam and Eve's disobedience. And that's in Genesis 3, 17 through 20. And this is also kind of an interesting foreshadow of Deuteronomy 28 where the Lord talks about a lot of the blessings and the curses if they follow the Lord and enter into a covenant with him. So that's pretty interesting. So now let's get to the meat and potatoes. I know we're probably pretty hungry but let's eat this bread and let's let the Lord nourish us in our spirit. In Genesis 3:21, also for Adam and his wife the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. And I find this pretty interesting because God just cursed the serpent. He told Adam and Eve that will be in effect because of their disobedience. He cursed the ground and told them that they will now die. And I believe that we can make an inference here that God sacrificed an animal to make these tunics of skin for Adam and Eve. And when I read this, my initial reaction was that God was covering their sins through the sacrifice and bloodshed of the animal he took the skins from, which is kind of a prophetic example of Jesus' life, life to come. But let us look at the verse in Hebrews, and this is Hebrews 10, chapter 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. You see, it was not that God clothed them in animal skin to take away their sins, but to seal that which God spoke in regard to the curse. And this was also a prophetic picture of Jesus 
whom was and did come to die. Now, in Genesis, I don't think we see specifically that Adam made a covenant with the Lord, but they were already in perfect communion together. And then we see the Lord give him a choice to be obedient and that there's also an opportunity for disobedience. And this is kind of when God's clothing him in the animal skin, that there's bloodshed happening. And I'm still learning about covenant and things in regards to covenant and what some of the old um, sacrifices look like and, and different rituals involving covenant. But I believe that when you broke a covenant, you had to cut an animal in half and essentially walk through as far as symbolizing that, you know, you had kind of broken that covenant. And right after God does this, close them in the tunics after he had brought the curses on, on the serpent and into the earth, then he exiles Adam and Eve out of the garden. So it's kind of this like interesting example of how they had, humanity had perfect communion with God, but in disobedience came sin, from that sin came death, and then he exiled them out of that perfect communion with them. And you see, it was not that God clothed them in animal skin to take away their sins, but to seal that which God spoke in regard to the curse. And then in Hebrews 9, 16 through 19, this is what it says. And this is in the New King James Version. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. So because God sacrificed an animal in its death, and the shedding of its blood sealed that which God spoke in the form of the curse over man, that you will surely die. Immediately after, God clothes them in tunics of skin and he expels them out of the garden. And they were forced out of communion with God due to their own sinful decisions. Not only were they forced out, but the way back was guarded so that they had no access back into communion with God. And I'm doing my best to create a visualization through God's word for you and I to see the significance that we were expelled from God's presence due to our sinful nature. And there was no way back into God's presence or that garden, for instance, where the tree of life was. And we no longer had access to being with God, nor the access to eat of the tree of life, which if they ate from that fruit, they would have eternal life, which was another reason that they had to be expelled from the garden that from that sin came death. And they had lost access to not only communion with God, but the ability of eternal life through eating of that fruit that came from the tree of life. So let's look at the power of the blood of Jesus. And I love this. And this is Jeremiah 31, verse 31 through 34. And this is God that says this. It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I'll be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. And through Jeremiah, God spoke of a new covenant that would come to fruition, where our iniquities would be forgiven, and our sins would be remembered no more. Hallelujah. This covenant was not sealed by the blood of animals, but by the blood of Jesus. And by Jesus dying on the cross, his blood was spilt, sealing the covenant into existence. And that's pretty interesting because 
God speaks that through the prophet of Jeremiah, this new covenant, but we didn't see that new covenant come to fruition until Jesus came. And what's interesting is that what we read about in Hebrews earlier about that testator having to die. So when they're talking about a will or they're talking about a covenant, once they speak that and then that death happens, that becomes basically a legal document or legislation. So God speaks through Jeremiah talking about this new covenant, but he still has to die for that to come into effect. So God comes to earth in the form of man as Jesus, the son of God. And what does he do? He ends up going to the cross and he dies on the cross. In that death comes the fruition of this new covenant. And it was by his body being broken and his blood being spilt on the cross that we now can hold on and enter into this new covenant, which is amazing, which is amazing. <laughs> so Hebrews 9, 23 through 26. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ had not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus Christ died and the significance of his resurrection was that he then ascended into the true holy of holies in heaven before God. And Jesus presented himself as the sacrifice lamb and sprinkled the mercy seat and throne of God with this perfect blood, atoning for our sins once and for all. Let's look at Hebrews 9, 16 through 17. We'll focus on Jesus' death here. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. A testament or will does not have any legal authority until after the death of the one who made it. So think of this, when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, he laid down the foundation for the legislation of the kingdom of heaven. And but when Jesus died, he brought it to full legal authority to everything that he spoke. And the death of Jesus was necessary for the establishment of the new covenant, and which is the forgiveness of iniquity and the blotting out of sin. It is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord and Savior. By death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, he is our life and way back into beautiful communion with our Father who is in heaven. Now it's awesome that Jesus is our high priest and that he's our mediator of this new covenant. That that way was originally guarded when we were exiled out of the Garden of Eden and it was guarded by a flaming sword and a cherubim. That the tree of life and eternal life was guarded and there was no way back into that. And it's because Jesus Christ died and is now seated and seated at the right hand of God right now, that he is currently mediating for us right now, and that he's the mediator of the new covenant, and that Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one can go to the Father except through him. So he is presently our way to the Father. Now we can come into the Holy of Holies, not of one in a natural temple, but of one that is in the heavenlies, where our Lord and Savior is sitting. Praise God. In Hebrews 9, 13 through 15, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the internal, eternal inheritance. Lord, 
Let us walk in a renewed conscience apart from dead works, and which is possible by your blood. And thank you, Lord. So let's just look at the power of the Lord's resurrection. And we'll read Hebrews 10, 11 through 14. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Jesus Christ sacrificed his body on the cross for the sins of the world. A worthy sacrifice that had the power to take away the sins of the world, which animals could never do. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Because Jesus rose from the dead, he then ascended into heaven, presenting himself before God the Father. And after he presented himself before God the Father, he then sat down at the right hand of God where he now presently sits, brothers and sisters, as our high priest. Thank you, Lord. Where through his blood we can enter into the most holy of holies, having perfect communion with God, which once before we could never enter. But because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we can now enter in boldly. I'll go ahead and I wrote a prayer, so if you have your devotional, we can read it together or or you can just receive this prayer. I thank you, my God, for your magnificence and splendor. Trying to understand a sliver of this revelation is frying my brain. (laughs) Yet in the small sliver of understanding, I'm in awe of you, Lord. I love you, Lord, and am thankful for all that you have done. Please bring forth further revelation and understanding of all that you have done. I praise you, Lord, and I ask you to encourage your body during this fast. Consecrate us further, and I thank you, my God, for setting us apart for your glory. May we be a fragrance that continually arises and pleases you in your throne room. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, Victory family, I hope that this devotional blessed you. I hope that this gave you a couple things to chew on, and if you're hungry, Come and eat it up, you know. And uh, I just bless you guys in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And keep going strong. I know this is day three. And we'll keep getting after it. Love you guys. (laughs) Be blessed.